Good morning, everyone, and good evening. If you are not in the United Kingdom, welcome to this opening event of the Diversity and British String Quartet Symposium, which is part of the Humanities Cultural Program, one of the founding stones for the future Stephen A. Schwarzman Centre for the Humanities. The project has also been generously supported by Arts Council of England, the RVW Trust and supporters of the Villiers Quartets from Home Commissions Fund. It is led by Joanna Boulevard and Professor Samantha Thiegman. My name is Paul Watt. I'm standing in for Joe Boulevant today to welcome you here. I'm uh, coming to you from, from Melbourne in, in Australia, uh, even though my day job uh, is, is in Adelaide and we have a few people um, in far flung places joining us this morning. This project uh, that has led up to the symposium has been all about using the British String Quartet as a lens through which to explore issues of identity, diversity, and inclusivity in British classical music. One of the many avenues into these questions is the history of the string quartet and the role played by composers and performers from marginalized groups. Uh, this first panel will therefore explore voices uh, and achievements from three such perspectives. Those are women, politically engaged composers, and emigres. I'm thrilled that Joanna asked me to chair this morning's uh, talk. Um, it wasn't until very recently that I knew about this project, and it is one of the most exciting things that, that has um, come across my radar in a very long time. And I read up about the program, talked to Adrian about it, and it, it's a fabulous project that is a real model um, of bringing academics and the community and performers together for a shared, a shared experience. And, and I thank Jo and her team for putting this together, it is completely inspiring. And I'm, um, apart from having to go to bed early and to leave you all at the end of this session, I'm really looking forward to attending as much as I can. So the first session that we have uh, coming up now um, are case studies in the British String Quartet around the theme of women, politics, and emigres. And I'm very pleased to welcome our speakers, Dr. Leah Broad from Oxford, Dr. Amanda Harris from the University of Sydney, and Dr. Florian Shedding from the University of Bristol. Um, so first, our first speaker will be Leah, who's going to look at how chamber music provided early 20th century women with a way of making a living through music when professional orchestras were largely closed to them, and how this history of women's involvement has been repeatedly erased over the course of the 20th century. Leah uh, is a junior research fellow at Christchurch, Oxford, She's currently writing a group biography of four women composers, Neville Smythe, Rebecca Clark, Dorothy Howell, and Doreen Carlton for Faber and Faber. And this idea of a group biography doesn't happen very much in, in musicological work. I'm really interested to see, to see how, it, how it turns out. No pressure, Leah. Um, it, it's a fairly common approach in literary studies, but I think it would have to be something of a first for, for a musicological undertaking. Uh, this project establishes these women's relative significance in their lifetimes, explores how this changes our narratives about British music of the period, and it looks in detail at how their music has been received since their death. Leah has published widely in journals, including Music and Letters and the Journal of the Royal Musical Association. Her work focuses on unfamiliar histories. She's fascinated by the people and music who are at the margins of Western art music histories. Delighted to welcome you, Leah. And just to the audience, just to let you know that if you have questions or responses or, or comments, they can be made in the Q&A section on the bottom right of your screen. Leah, welcome. Thank you. Thank and you very much. look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so I'm, I'm going to share my screen, hopefully, she says. Um, so everybody can see that. Um, so hi, thank you very, very much for coming. Um, yes, as Paul was saying, I'm currently writing a book about four women composers. Uh, and the two who I'm gonna be talking about today really are Ethel Smythe and Rebecca Clark, who are really, really important um, in the British String Quartet in the early 20th century. Um, so British String Quartet, uh, where to start out? So. I thought when I was putting together this talk, I thought, okay, well, where do we actually begin with what might constitute the British string quartet? Um, and I think where to start is sort of closer to the present. Um, 
And this perception that women are in some way not involved or are a bit anomalous uh, in the string quartet in Britain. So, and this is, you know, not just in Britain, but across the world. So in 1989, uh, the Los Angeles Times hailed the Colorado Quartet as the first all-female string quartet to play major league chamber music. They celebrated the quartet for breaking all the rules, for having the courage to be what they called an anomaly in the traditionally male-dominated world of the classical string quartet. And so, you know, that's in 1989. Let's fast forward a decade uh, to 1998. And all women quartets are still being framed as unusual within the mostly male sphere of the string quartet. So this is The Independent in the UK. They're running a story about how the all woman lineup of the Sorrel Quartet was a sign of the changing face of chamber music. Um, and this is the Sorrel Quartet on the right with their colorful silk shirts that The Independent pointed out. Um, and then in 2003, so really not, not that long ago, we have Ivan Hewitt writing for the Telegraph that the Sorrel Quartet knocked on the head all of his male prejudices about all female quartets. His prejudice being that all female quartets could play in a way that was subtle and sensitive, but not powerful. And then if we come almost up to the present day, we get to a 2019 headline from one of the most widely read classical music bloggers, Norman Lebrecht, that announced the Artemis Quartet as the first major string quartet with more women than men. And in the article, he goes on to say that the Artemis Quartet was shattering a glass ceiling by having three women members. So the Colorado and the Sorrel Quartets, it seems, have been forgotten somewhere along the way. So what's going on here and, and why does it matter? Because critical surprise at women's involvement in string quartets as either performers or composers has a very long and illustrious history in Britain. And certainly it is true that in some ways the string quartet as a genre has historically been dominated by men, but certainly not as much as these articles are suggesting. So in the next 20 minutes or so, uh, we're gonna look a little bit at the history of women's involvement with the string quartet as both composers and performers, and why it matters that all women string quartets are still being written about as unusual in the 21st century. So we're gonna focus in on the early 20th century which was really quite a productive period for British women as far as string quartets are concerned. Um, so we're looking particularly at these two women. We've got Rebecca Clark on the left wearing the necklace and Ethel Smythe on the right with the tie. Um, both were composers and Clark was also a violist who made her living from professional chamber music performance. So between them, they give a good sense of what opportunities string quartets offered women during this period. So, uh, first up, a little bit of myth busting about these all women string quartets. They have certainly been around in Britain since at least the Victorian period. So this is the Shinner Quartet, which was founded in 1886 by the violinist Emily Shinner, who's on the far left. And in their first reviews, we can see a similar kind of tone to the Los Angeles Times in 1989. So the musical world called the Shinner Quartet, a novelty unique of its kind in London, which added a new phase to our musical life. But in the 1880s, an all-woman quartet in Britain was actually a novelty. Um, during this period, music was part of every middle and upper class women's education. Um, women were usually taught to sing or to play the piano, but it was only in relatively recent years that violin had become an acceptable instrument for women to learn. And it was even more unusual for women to play the cello or viola, but obviously, as this major demonstrates, not unheard of. Um, <clears throat> And the reason why it had previously uh, been a sort of unpopular instrument for women to play is because it was felt that sort of string, uh, string instruments contorted the body into various unattractive and unseemly positions. And the violin had extra connotations as well. It was associated with sin and the devil, um, as we can see in this painting um, in the top left. And the violin itself as an instrument was stereotypically gendered female and it was considered quite a sensuous instrument. So it was thought inappropriate for women to play the violin, not just because it was unattractive to watch, um, but because it was in some ways sinful um, for them to be playing this particular instrument. So it's not until 1872 that the Royal Academy of Music starts to accept their first women violin students, having accepted women on violin and piano uh, for quite some time previously. And one of the key figures in changing the status of women violinists uh, in the UK is the Moravian violinist, 
Wilma Neruda, who's uh, the violinist in the pictures, both with the Joachim Quartet and on the right hand side. Um, and she had an absolutely extraordinary career. She toured internationally as a soloist and she appeared first as a soloist with the London Philharmonic Orchestra at the age of 11. And uh, you know, she later married the English conductor and pianist Charles Halle, and she had a very, very prominent pro profile in the UK. And her popularity in Britain helped to break down the barriers around women playing string instruments. And towards the end of the 19th century, it was becoming quite commonplace for middle class women to learn string instruments alongside piano um, and their singing studies. And professional institutions like the Royal Academy were training hundreds of women as string players, but this leads to a bottleneck because it was accepted that women might be soloists like Neruda, but professional orchestras were still closed off to women. It wasn't until, 19, until 1913 that a professional British orchestra hired women to their string section. And this was the Queen's Hall Orchestra in London conducted by uh, Henry Wood. And so women were being trained as top class musicians, but there were no jobs for them to continue performing. They could always teach, and a lot of women did, but a large number would also turn to chamber music. You know, women needed nobody to hire them to set up their own ensemble, and they could rent halls for performances and they could play in salons. So string quartets offered huge opportunities for women. And one woman who was part of this sort of uh, women's chamber music renaissance was the violist and composer Rebecca Clark. She was born in Harrow in 1886, so she's very much within uh, the generation of middle class women who were seeking some kind of employment to support themselves with an independent income. And her route into music was through string quartets. Her father wanted to have a family ensemble, so he made all his children play string instruments, and Rebecca was taught first the violin. And this early introduction to uh, music really cemented a love of chamber performance in her. All her life she would promote chamber music and the vast majority of her works are for chamber ensembles. So she's pictured here uh, with the English Ensemble, which is the chamber group that she set up in the late 1920s and continued to perform with throughout the 1930s. And in the musicological literature, Clark has received some criticism for the fact that she didn't write orchestral or operatic works. And the fact that she wrote mostly chamber works has been framed as evidence that she kind of internalized the widespread idea that women were incapable of writing large scale works. Um, but I think in some ways this incorrectly applies a general rule to an individual case, because while many women might not have composed orchestral or operatic works because of societal convention or because they didn't have access to the institutions needed that, to write these works successfully, uh, this was not the case for Rebecca Clark. She studied both at the Royal Academy and then the Royal College of Music, first as a violinist and then as a composer. And her composition tutor was Charles Stanford, who was you know, one of the most prominent composition tutors of the day. And he certainly encouraged and supported her as a composer, even to the point that she swapped from the violin to the viola at his suggestion. Um, he felt that playing the viola in the Royal College Orchestra would give her a better sense of how the orchestra worked. Um, so, you know, as a viola player, she, he said that she would be in the middle of the sound. So she has orchestral performance from both the academy and the college. She's played in both the orchestras there. She has the professional experience. And furthermore, she was one of the six women hired in 1913 to the Queen's Hall Orchestra. So this is her with her five other colleagues who were hired in 1913 to this professional orchestra. And when offered the opportunity to compose for this orchestra by the conductor Henry Wood, Clark turned it down. She saw herself as a chamber musician. That was where her heart lay and she composed accordingly. So instead of seeing her involvement in string quartets as a limitation or a way in which women were confined, uh, we can also see this as a choice and see these chamber groups as places of opportunity for Rebecca Clark. And nothing demonstrates this better than her experience in 1910 uh, when her father threw her out of the house. Because to put it mildly, Clark had an extremely strained relationship with her father. And when she's 24, things reach a breaking point. He banishes her from the family home. She's left on the streets of London with only her viola and 12 pounds that she had in a post office savings account. But she manages to support herself, mainly by playing in chamber groups. Um, so she auditioned and was hired as a violist in one of the most famous all women quartets of the day, the Nora Clench Quartet. 
And she managed to pull together an income from this, from freelance gigging and from performing with the Royal College of Music's orchestra, where she was um, given a fee to perform. And so initially she took all the work she could get and she ended up playing an absolutely vast repertoire of music, uh, ranging from 17th century French music to modern compositions and including all the classics of the string quartet repertoire, so Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms, Borjak, uh, etc. And not only did this give her an income, but being able to become so familiar with such an enormous amount of music was really formative for her as a composer. So in her later years, you can hear the influence of the string quartet repertoire that she played in her earlier life. You can definitely hear this in her later works. Um, you can hear Vorjak in her concert work, Dumka for uh, viola, violin and piano. And there are sort of elements, influences of Debussy and Ravel in her 1919 viola sonata. But perhaps I think most important as an influence is the sense of intimacy and physicality between players that Clark learned from performing in these string quartets. And that I think she really replicates in all of her works. Um, and Clark experienced playing in these groups in a very powerful, physical, very bodily way. She wrote in her memoir, which is uh, still unpublished, that for her, the dividing line between music and sex is so tenuous as to be almost non-existent. And that even when listening to music, a mutual glance of shared recognition can induce a momentary shiver of something very much like a kind of rarefied sex. And so of Beethoven's string quartet, she wrote that a dissonance between the cello and viola in the second movement of the Razumovsky quartet in E minor created a vibration between the players that was so powerful that it thrills one almost like an electric shock. And she felt that you really only understood this when you played it yourself as a performer. And I think as far as Clark's composition is concerned, the importance of this very physical relationship between players was one of the most significant things that Clark took from her experience as a quartet performer. This kind of intimacy between performers and also with the audience as well, drives all of her music, especially in her dramatic songs like The Seal Man, which I want to play a short extract from now. And this is Patricia Wright and Jonathan Reese um, recorded for the Guild record label um, playing uh, the seal man and listen to the way that she uses the voice both she uses both almost sort of quasi spoken a kind of melodramatic voice as well as a singing voice and the synchronicity you need to have between the pian pianist and the singer is extraordinary and so you get this ex real sense of intimacy partly through this use of spoken voice it's like she is inviting you in as the singer to listen as an audience member so you might want to turn your sound up for this because when we ran it in the tests earlier it's quite quiet but this is the seal man by rebecca clark <laughs> 
and we are going to stop there. Um, so Clark continued playing in chamber groups until she began to retire from performance towards the end of World War II. And one of the pieces that she played in her long career was the E minor string quartet by Ethel Smythe, who was Clark's contemporary and colleague. They knew each other, um, even though Smythe in her in her more kind of, shall we say political vein, she never sought to promote Rebecca Clark's music as a fellow woman composer, um, but they did know each other. And Smythe is definitely one of the more formidable figures of British classical music. She composed six operas, which were absolutely integral to the debates about the identity of English national opera, which were incredibly prominent in her lifetime. This was a widely discussed issue um, in the public press. Um, and Smythe's operas were discussed very much as this sort of sense of, a, of an English operatic school that was sort of uh, thought to be being established in the early 20th century. Um, but perhaps she's most famous now for her involvement with the suffragettes. Between 1910 and 1912, she dedicated herself to the suffrage movement and she was involved uh, in a relationship with Emmeline Pankhurst, who was the leader of the Women's Social and Political Union. And during this period, Smythe wrote a number of compositions that were inspired by the Pankhursts or deal with women's rights and the fight for suffrage in some way. The most explicit of these are her 1910 choral pieces, Songs of Sunrise, which includes the March of the Women, which became the WSPU's anthem. And Smythe was jailed for throwing stones through a politician's window, and she's particularly famous for conducting her fellow suffragettes singing the march from the window of her jail cell in Holloway Prison using her toothbrush as a baton. Um, but among her many suffrage works is her string quartet in E minor. She had completed the first and second movements in 1902, but she then discarded the work. Um, and it was only a decade later that Smythe felt ready to return to the quartet and she completed the third and fourth movements around 1912. And her letters to Emmeline Pankhurst give us some insight into why Smythe felt uh, able to finish the work in 1912 and what this particular composition meant to her. So for Smythe, she really saw string quartets as a real compositional challenge. When she was studying in Leipzig in 1878, she wrote to her mother that her hair was growing gray over her attempts to write a string quartet, and she hoped that her mother would never do anything so fear fearfully puzzling and confusing as writing your first string quartet. And although she, you know, she completed that particular quartet, over the years she abandons multiple attempts at another quartet, maintaining that they were one of the hardest forms of composition that she knew. And in 1913, she wrote to Pankhurst that she conceived of the string quartet as being like an abstraction or perhaps an, like an outline. No, more like a scaffolding. It's awfully purified of all helps to assimilation. For me, the most exquisite form of art and the hardest. An orchestral work is almost child's play in comparison because there are so many ingredients that a rotten egg can pass undetected, as it might in a plum pudding. A string quartet is an exquisite omelette. So the high standards that she set herself for the completion of string quartets perhaps explain why she had previously set aside the movements that she had already completed. Um, so what made the difference in 1912? Well, in nearly all of Smythe's work, there's an element of autobiography. Uh, with some composers, the relationship between their life and works is oblique, making it very difficult to draw links between events and compositions with any certainty. Um, but many of Smythe's finest pieces were inspired by and tangibly, tangibly related to people she knew. So some of the most turbulent personal periods in her life were also her most prolific. So her mass, for example, was inspired by a woman called Pauline Trevelyan. Uh, her chorus, Hey Nonny No, was inspired by the harpsichordist Violet Gordon Woodhouse and her three songs of 1913 by the Pankhursts. And it seems that in 1912, Smythe's involvement with the suffrage campaign had provided her with the inspiration that she needed to complete the quartet. She wrote to Emmeline that the final movement was suffragette um, or the people, and it does rather suggest hilarity in the streets, a crowd laughing with a jeering nuance, while bringing things home to them is the only way. And we're going to get to hear this quartet, uh, you know, later on in the event. So listen out for the final movement, because the final movement is full of sudden juxtapositions and attacks on the cello that are really quite aggressive. And it's as though Smythe has composed a battle between 
earnestness and skepticism, the two fighting it out throughout the movement, which ends in this kind of abrupt but very all-consuming burst. And you can kind of hear exactly this kind of jeering nuance and the things that she's talking about in this quote in the final movement of the quartet. So in this instance, for Smythe, the string quartet becomes a vehicle for the expression of both her personal thoughts and her political ideals. So far from being an exclusively male domain then, in the early 20th century, the string quartet gave a home to women who were both performers and composers. It's a way for women to express their hopes and fears and a way for them to earn a living as musicians when other avenues were closed to them. And this history is important because forgetting is such a powerful form of erasure. And by forgetting these women, we force women who come after them to retread paths that have been walked before. And more than that, it makes regression more difficult to notice if history is reset once every generation. So the all woman Colorado Quartet have sort of become unusual again in 1989, but they're certainly not the first all female string quartet to play major, major league chamber music, not even close. But the fact that they were thought of that way, thought of that way in 1989 points to a different problem, which is that after World War II, the string quartet does get slightly more male dominated than it was before the war. So if we care about diversity in the British string quartet, this is a moment we need to pay attention to. These are the histories that we need to be digging out because without the knowledge of people like Clark and Smythe, we don't notice that post-war we're seeing these sort of, uh, we can assume that it has always been the case that there have been headlines like, oh, the housewife composer as Ruth Gipps was labeled. Um, and there are a lot of very, very, gendered and derogatory forms of commentary uh, after the Second World War that mean that women <laughs> almost sort of like have some of the progress undone that has been made before the Second World War. But women have always played a role in the development of the string quartet in Britain as listeners and as performers and composers, and they continue to be. Some of the most exciting works for string quartet are now coming from composers like Eleanor Alberga, Dobrynka Tabakova and Freya Whaley Cohen. And this is to say nothing of performers either. So classical music in general has a pretty long way to go before anything like gender equality is achieved. But the renewed enthusiasm for and increased performances of historical work by women and indeed events like this seems like a very good place to start. Thank you. Leah, that, that was fabulous. Uh, a stroll back in time to really highlight the, um, the different perception of diversity that we, we, we thought we didn't have, but we, we, we did in fact have. It's, it's good that uh, this long review uh, not only takes us back, but, but reminds us of the domestic sphere um, in, in which a lot of these performances would, would take place. Now, um, those who are here in the audience can, can um, populate any questions or comments in the q and I don't see anything there yet. So I, I'm going to take the liberty and, and ask the first question. And this, this might be a bit um, off, off topic, but, but I'll give it a go. I loved what you talked when you talked about the sensuality of the communication between performers. And it's, it's, it's a sensuality, it, you know, it might even be a, a, a sexuality depending on, on how we interpret that. And I wonder in, in the domestic sphere, not least of all that, um, you know, there, there are probably lots of cases where there are female string quartets happening that we would just never know about that because they're lost to, to history. But is, have you found any instances where this sensuality has, been, has bothered people so much, presumably men, that instead of having women perform, that, that there's been a, a move to, to recast the music as a piano, a piano arrangement, so to sort of control, prevent the sensuality that might arise mm -hmm. in, in a performance. Um, it's just a curious thing. Just wondered if you'd ever come across any, any instances of, of that. That's yeah, probably. so this is an interesting one. There is certainly commentary on the sort of sen inappropriate sensuality of women performers. I don't know of different arrangements being made, although Amanda might be able to correct me on this one uh, if she knows of any. But certainly there's an enormous commentary uh, on women performers in orchestras and women conductors being 
too hot to handle, basically, and it will distract the male performers. And so that has been given as a reason why women should not be either conductors or performers. And that that really goes back a very, very long way. And you see sometimes extraordinary comments, but not so extraordinary <laughs> when you see some of the commentary that comes out now about performers like Yuja Wang, for example, where sometimes I read the reviews of the comments about her, her body and about her clothing. Um, it doesn't surprise me <laughs> then reading some of the commentary from some 1913, 1960, 1970, 80. Um, so I don't know if any uh, changes to instrumentation being made. But bear in mind as well, these are not just domestic performances. Rebecca Clark had a phenomenal mm. international career. She was on the stages of the Aeolian Hall, the Wigmore. She was a big performer. These are not just um, performances in her living room. Uh, and the salons that she played in, the, the sort of invite only private performances were also attended by Bax, by Vaughan Williams, by the biggest names of the day. And I think we sometimes have a tendency because women are involved to go, oh, it was private, it was domestic. There are a lot of men there as well. <laughs> um, and they are, that this was like a platform for them to get their music played and Clark is one of those. And so this distinction between private and public and domestic and public, I want to problematize a little bit because it's really Good. overlapping, definitely. Yes, and it, so it does overlap, yeah. 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 Wonderful. We have two questions. Um, we well, th just a third. We're, we're going to um, hear from Amanda Harris first, and then I'm going. To, I, I think I have to read the questions out. There's a question from Anthony Broad, and then one from Ron Tendler. So we'll start with Amanda, then go to Anthony, then to Ron. So Amanda, fire away. Thanks, Paul, and thanks so much, Leah. What a terrific presentation and such a wonderful opening to this session. Um, I was really struck by your the way you both opened and closed talking about this idea of the performances being reviewed as um, women shattering the glass ceiling and and the forgetting of history, this constant process of reinventing history that um, that is such a feature, I think, of the way women composers are written or indeed not written into music history. Um, that, and, and that's something I've found very much in my research too, that you, the, the sort of each time a, a woman composer had works performed, especially in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, there's sort of these calls of, oh, the first woman composer ever, even though there's, you know, she's of course building on um, not just a history, but also a community of colleagues and that sort of thing. And I and I wonder about if you could say something about how your book that you're writing, which brings together this kind of collective history of four women composers alongside each other, how that is a sort of, I don't know, an intervention in this kind of canonical, you know, making of music history to sort of build in a way in, in a single book, a community of women composers in the way that you're doing. Thank you for a really lovely question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I think this is one of the reasons why I wanted to write about a group of women composers, particularly because Smythe gets singled out a lot. And she, you know, she contributes to this herself. She likes to write about herself as the exceptional woman. She doesn't give as much publicity to other women composers of whom she's very aware. Right? <laughs> um, she is writing about herself as, as the exception, the sort of the honorary man, which is why she should be invited into this club. Um, but she's really not. And <laughs> she is in some ways exceptional. And I understand, you know, there is a drive. It is extraordinary when women manage to be the first to do this thing, but they're always building on the work of women previously. And I'm very aware of the fact that my book is coming on the back of, you know, decades of work um, by other scholars, often women, without whose work I would not be able to be even thinking about writing this book today and to be able to take it to a publisher and have them say, yes, here are some women, some of whom I've never heard. We want to hear about them. That sounds great. Um, and there are there are other examples of group biography, particularly um, for women composers, because I think networks are so important. Like if we look at Rihanna Matthias's book, that, for example, is inspirational in the way that she knots together women's lives. And I think for me, because as well, this book spans from Ethel Smythe's birth in 1858 to Doreen death in 2003. I wanted to kind of be able to bring out this sense of cyclical forgetting. And it's so frustrating because, you know, the Sorrel Quartet, uh, that quote about them being the colorful silk shirts, they're breaking, changing the face of classical music. They recorded Coberthan's 
string quartet. And it was received at the time as being oh, exceptional. An all-woman quartet is recording this work by a woman. The work was premiered by an all-woman quartet. <laughs> and it's so frustrating that those women have been written out. And I think that was partly why I wanted to write a group biography to get this sense of this glass she ceiling being rebuilt over and over and over and over again. And at the same time, some of the women like Rebecca Clark in my book are team players. She supports other women. She is a fantastic kind of example of women supporting other women. And then you have the women who don't do that. They don't want to be seen as women. Uh, in in a kind of like in a way that that's the woman composer label is seen as derogatory and they want to avoid that so they're like I'm, I'm nothing to do with this I don't work with other women I only work with good people if they happen to be women and so I think writing a group biography allows me to show the different strategies that women have used to deal with discrimination basically because it's not all the same and yeah I think for me that was why writing a group biography was so important and I, I really hope that it will be able to do justice to any of the things I've just said. <laughs> so yes, thank you for that question. Thanks Amanda and thanks Leah. Our next, next question is come, comes from Anthony Broad who asks, why do you think the female musician was set back historically after the Second World War? Mm, yeah, really good question, especially because mm -hmm. there's this narrative that says that women the second world war offers up so many opportunities for women and for women's employment which is true but there's also a backlash post-war particularly when you have men coming back from fighting and they want their jobs back in orchestras and women have sort of been taking these roles and there's a sense of oh this was only temporary men should be able to get their jobs back now and so on top of that there's a rise in family values because of you know the mortality of the second world war um there's a rise in family values and there is a counter narrative that says that women's employment during world war ii was temporary and it was always assumed to be the case and so i think we've fighting there's a sort of fault line in the kind of ways in which women are talked about and the ways in which women are living their lives post second world war which means that actually particularly for musicians that it isn't as much progress as one would like to think and so that's something that definitely I'm kind of digging into is what's going on why are we suddenly seeing all these sort of like well, we're not suddenly seeing but there's certainly a proliferation still of the idea that women are wives and mothers and that it's extraordinary for them to do something else like there's a when Ruth Gibbs conducts Beethoven's Ninth there are all these reviews that say, oh my goodness, you wouldn't expect a woman to conduct Beethoven's Ninth any more than you would expect her to <laughs> build the Great Boulder Dam or to like order a surplus army raises. This is outrageous. Um, and that is, is post-war. <laughs> um, and that is something I think that we, we, certainly I am very interested in looking into in terms of understanding <laughs> this sense of how women's lives have unfolded and what, setbacks they've had over the last hundred years. Terrific, thank you. Thanks Anthony for the question and Leah for your answer. And finally, and um, before we move on to the next speaker, there's a comment from Ron Tendler to say, are you aware that Morpheus for Viola and Piano by Clark is a grade eight viola examination piece for the ABRSM? Uh, I didn't know it was still on there, but yes, great. <laughs> and yes, yeah, so this is so Clark's music in particular has never really gone away, right? She has been performed throughout the 20th century, very often by amateur groups as well, post Second World War. Um, but this is something that, again, so I don't want to. I'm very keen to avoid the narrative that says that these women were just erased from history and now there's been some like flowering mm -hmm. of rediscovery. No, uh, performers have been playing this music and certain groups have always known about it and it's always been performed within those groups and we mustn't write those groups out by pretending that they don't exist. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Thank you for putting it out. Great. So we'll... we'll um... Thank Leah for, for your talk and to Ron, Anthony and Amanda for your questions. And Leah, um, I'm sure I speak for all of us that we're looking forward to the book and to reading what you've got to say. It, it sounds like a really hard thing to do, but we're sure you'll um, 
you'll you'll um, be fantastic. Thank you very so, much. So so join me in thanking uh, Leah for for her talk. Lovely. Um, we're now going to hear from from Amanda Harris, and you know it, it's becoming a thing these last couple of years that that I never get to see my Australian friends, and unless we're at an international conference, and so history is continuing to to repeat itself. Um, Amanda's going to talk to us about the Australian composer Margaret Sutherland, whose chamber music was featured in concerts of the Society of Women Musicians, um, as my string quartet was in the in the nineteen twenties. Um, and his string quartet was premiered at the British Music Society in Melbourne, Australia in 1938. And the reception of Smythe's music and reception um, of that of an overseas composer coming to Britain from the far corners of the, of the British Empire raises some um, interesting questions about the boundaries of so-called British music. And both Smythe and Sutherland had plenty to say about the role of women composers, the new musical directions emerging in this period. And in particular, in relation to the string quartet, form and chamber music more broadly. Um, Amanda Harris is a senior research fellow at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music in the University of Sydney. She's interested in giving voice to those often excluded from conventional music histories and her research focuses on gender and intercultural musical cultures. Her 2009 doctoral dissertation investigated the links between a burgeoning culture of women composers and first wave feminist movements in England, France and Germany. She's the editor of three books and articles uh, in Women's History Review, Women and Music, 20th Century Music, Postcolonial Studies, Australian Historical Studies, and History and Anthropology. So a really wide sweep of scholarship across a really rich um, interdisciplinary thread. Her monograph uh, called Representing Australian Aboriginal Music and Dance, 1930 to 1970, was published very recently by Bloomsbury. Amanda, welcome. And, and uh, we're all looking forward to hearing what you've got to say about Sutherland and, and no doubt others. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, and thanks all for having me. Um, I wanna start by acknowledging the land that I'm on here in joining this session um, as Aboriginal land and to pay my respect to Darawal elders past and present as continuing um, custodians of this country that I live and work on. And I'm going to focus today, um, oh, I better share my screen, which I almost forgot to do. I'm going to focus today on the middle word in this, um, uh, in the three themes that are framing this session of case studies in the string quartet, namely politics. But I'll admit from the outset that um, I will most certainly fail to contain this talk within that central theme and will uh, certainly veer into um, the territory of both women and if not emigres, then this sort of broader question of um, migration or um, of, of kind of national identities that that term hints at. Um, so, and you'll see from the title of my, my talk, which is now up on the screen, um, that as Paul said, I'll be talking about the Australian composer, Margaret Sutherland, but also um, actually the large part of my talk, I'll be focusing also on Ethel Smythe, which Leah has already given us um, such a fantastic introduction to. Um, I'll focus in talking about Smythe on the, the way her string quartet can be read in the context of a broader picture of feminist politics at this time. And in talking about Margaret Sutherland, um, as Paul said in his introduction, I'm aiming to explore the idea of Britishness, given the context of the, the kind of overall symposium. Um, and as Paul said, Sutherland's string quartet being premiered at the British Music Society in Melbourne, Australia. Of course, Ethel Smythe's Britishness can hardly be contested. And yet to the extent that her music has been overlooked as a formative part of some British traditions, though of course there's a revival of much of her music now, even though, um, as Leah suggested, um, she's very much um, composing at the time of an, Eng an English musical renaissance um, but because of this, this sort of questionable role of her music in, in a British music tradition, we might find cause to wonder about her Britishness. And this wondering, I think, brings us to questions of gender, 
and the role of that in the kind of canons we've already uh, alluded to, and also about her musical cosmopolitanism that really touched on German Romanticism, on French Impressionism and kind of Orientalism, and of course um, in her operas, um, which are very much rooted in Cornish, well, at least one is rooted in Cornish legend and idiom. Indeed, the slipperiness of definitions of Britishness is highlighted by asking what's in and out of that category. And the second composer, Margaret Sutherland, who I'll talk about um, after I've, I've talk, talked a bit more about Smythe, really, I think, draws our attention to this question of what's in and out. As um, during her lifetime, when she was in Britain, she was very much positioned as an overseas composer, even if in her homeland of Australia, the only citizenship category available to her was British subject, at least until 1949, when the Australian Nationality and Citizenship Act of 1948 came into effect. And so the events that I've plotted on a timeline that I'm about to show you highlight themes in the lives of two, the two string quartets I'll talk about. Um, and I'll try and unpack the relevance of thinking about women's musical networks and the politics of these networks, as well as these questions of national belonging in music that arise from thinking about these works alongside one another. So to um, this little timeline that aims to orient us in the world of the events I'll discuss, and in particular to place at the centre of these worlds two string quartets performed between 1912 and 1938, as well as two musical societies active in this period. So um, Smythe's uh, string quartet in E minor was given its very first hearing at um, the first concert of the Society of Women Musicians in 1912. At, at this time, only two movements were performed and probably the other two were still incomplete, though they were, they were close to being finished. And then the full quartet was premiered at Beckstein Hall in London in May 1913, and then performed at Vienna in uh, in Vienna in December of the same year. And we'll return to this this performance for a, a review that I think casts an interesting light on these question national questions um, a bit later. Uh, the Society of Women Musicians concerts would also be the site of performance of an early chamber work by Margaret Sutherland. Um, her violin sonata was performed at the Society's concert in 1924 after it had been composed in London under the tutelage of Arnold Bax. And then lectures by both composers were also featured by the Society of Women Musicians. At the 1922 Composers Conference, Smythe lectured on the problems of British opera. And then Sutherland um, lectured on some rhythmical features of modern composition at the Society of Women Musicians 1925 conference. So the, the Society is then an organisation that links these two composers together. Um, but further, we can see that in programming both Smythe's Unfinished Quartet and a brand new work by a composer from the far corners of the British Empire, Sutherland's Violin Sonata, works that for both composers became their most some of their most performed works and well-known works we see through these performances a network that brought women's music into the public domain in powerful ways and engaged women both as creative and as intellectual contribute contributors to public discourse about the arts so then we have Sutherland's String Quartet, which was composed a bit later in 1937. And this was premiered at another society, the British Music Society of Victoria in Melbourne, um, Australia in 1938. This organisation had been founded jumping back to 1921 by Louise Hanson Dyer, a very important figure in music publishing um, in both Australia and in Europe. I'm highlighting the British Music Society as the organisation to premiere Sutherland's work. Um, and in doing so, I'm aiming to suggest there might be something useful to think about here in understanding the bounds of British music at this time. There's no question that Sutherland is understood to be an Australian composer. She spent almost her entire life in Australia. She made major contributions to the building of musical cultures and institutions in Australia and to debates about national identities in music.
But she composed these chamber works at a time when she was legally defined as a British subject. So while by no means an emigre in Britain, it may be that this category of overseas composers who were active parts of so-called British music can usefully inform the kind of discussion we're having today. To extend this thinking about the boundaries of national music traditions, we might also look at how Sutherland, an outsider looking in, regarded Smythe, a fellow woman composer and elder stateswoman in the domain of composition. And in the Australian media, Smythe and Sutherland were discussed alongside one another in newspaper articles um, published in Australia in the 1930s as kind of exemplars of women composers. Sutherland was sceptical about Smythe's part in the propagation of British music, suggesting instead that she was following in a German romantic tradition rather than what Sutherland con considered to be the more modern and advanced emerging British music tradition. Um, perhaps indeed the larger point that these musings direct us to is the idea of how the bounds of British music can or should be drawn at a time when Britain had not cut ties with many corners of its former empire and was also increasingly aligned with some parts of continental Europe and, and, of course, with growing animosity with other parts of continental Europe. All this, I think, complicates questions about which composers might be considered in and out of the national category of British music. And I look forward to hearing Florian's um, uh, discussion of the, this uh, in the third uh, presentation today. So the Society of Women Musicians, to come back to them, uh, is important to this discussion for being the kind of organisation that built networks for women and launched women's com compositions into the public, opening pathways for these works to be heard. The society had been founded in 1911 uh, by composer Catherine Egar, singer Gertrude Eaton and violinist and musicologist Marion Scott and was formed as a means of providing support networks to women both musicians and composers, performing musicians and composers. And this was a significant distinction in discourse about what women were capable of at this time. The society engaged both high profile composers and networks of women musicians who were not necessarily active as composers. As Egar later wrote in a tribute to Marion Scott, it was the loneliness of the woman who wanted to compose, her lack of contact with other composers, of any opportunity to discuss and exchange experiences. That was what, what touched Marion in her post-student life and made her feel that something could be done." End quote. The Society of Women Musicians had a complicated relationship to feminist movements. At the first meeting of the organisation, the chairman's address included an acknowledgement of what the speaker described as a lurking fear that the society was actually a suffragist organisation. In this address, the society asserted that they were in fact not a suffrage society, although they admitted there was a certain commonality of ideals between the two groups. We know, of course, that Smythe's reception as a suffragette was far more unambiguous than that of the Society of Women Musicians. In a 1913 review of a performance of Smythe's works by the London Symphony Orchestra, Smythe's musical efforts were linked to the struggle for women's rights, suggesting Smythe was the composer whom every fighter in the great liberative war of women calls by the name of Comrade. Indeed, just about every short bio to be found on Ethel Smythe notes that she was not only an English composer of six operas and a wide range of orchestral chamber and choral works, but was also a prominent suffragette committed to the militant struggle for women's suffrage. Now, this was, of course, as Leah has um, already indicated, only two years um, that Smythe devoted to the suffrage movement. really a brief period in the context of her 86 years. And yet this two year diversion from her career as a composer and writer endures as a memorable and prominent element of her ongoing reputation. And again, as Leah has said, um, it's also incredibly important to the string quartet in particular. Mm -mm, I apologize for my croakiness. Um, Smythe joined the ranks of the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU, in 1911 after meeting Emmeline Pankhurst and being very much, in her account, swept off her feet by Pankhurst, 
but also convinced by the values of the movement and the res their resonance with her own politics. <clears throat> in aligning herself with them, she was forced to consider the viability of maintaining her career in music alongside a commitment to political militancy. In one of her several volumes of memoirs, Smythe wrote, eventually I decided to give up two years to what I knew was wholly incompatible with the artistic creation, the suffrage fight, and then to go back firmly to my own job. In feminist paper, The Suffragette, founded by Christabel Pankhurst in 1912, <clears throat> Smythe's musical success was lauded as a triumph for women. Who did not feel the significance of the spectacle of a woman receiving as a creator, not as so often before, as an interpreter in the realm of music, the homage of the public? And here's this um, sense that I alluded to before, that there's something very different in creating music um, than there is in interpreting it, that this act of creation is not something we expect of women. But if the feminist press um, really celebrated this link between music and politics. This was not the case more broadly. In another article written for the Musical News uh, in 1913, um, the writer suggested that Smythe was imbued with a masculinity quite abnormal in the gen gentler sex. To be a strong composer, a woman must be a suffragist, and we do not desire to hold out any extra inducement to the suffragist cause. We should prefer to think that there is nothing in common between votes and notes. Indeed, it might have comforted this particular commentator that Smythe's engagement with a very militant feminist politics was unique. Women composers who were Smythe's contemporaries were rarely involved in an explicit feminist politics in the way that Smythe was. And it was much more common for composers to distance themselves in the sort of tones that the Society of Women Musicians had, not to say, um, not to say we don't share common ideals, but this is not a suffragist organisation or this is not a feminist organisation. Um, however, whether or not women engage themselves with feminist politics, uh, public commentary on their efforts was often um, routine, was routinely associated with the feminist politics of first wave feminism at this time. Uh, so that merely by seeking to have their works performed, women were associated with feminist movements. An example of this is the French composer Lily Boulanger, um, who in 1913, we're really circling around these years, 1913 in particular, 1911 to 1913, uh, Lily Boulanger was awarded the prestigious Prix de Rome Composition Prize. Um, <clears throat> and the range of commentary on that in the press, um, some of which is up on the screen, feminism has just carried off a decisive and dazzling victory. Or a young suffragette, Mademoiselle Lily Boulanger, has just trump triumphed in the most recent Prix de Rome competition over all her male competitors. Others suggested that triumphing in music was a gentler form of woman womanly assertion than marching in the streets. Uh, as uh, exemplified here, their methods in France are not those which they use with devastation in England. Uh, art seems to suffice them here, which is as it should be, from an amiable race and a sex which excels at pleasing. Yesterday, the Academy of the Fine Arts endorsed this peaceful feminism in awarding Mademoiselle Lily Boulanger the first Grand Prix de Rome in musical composition for 1913. So even for a composer who largely kept out of women's politics, politics as Boulanger did, we see that women's participation in musical cultures was framed as feminist regardless of their own views and actions in this domain. To return to Smythe, the analysis of her string quartet shows an analytical tussle in understanding the quartet for its formal characteristics on one hand and place within a history of the form, and understanding its potential extra musical meanings and what we might make of those. And uh, we see in this program, in terms of this place within the history of the form, that in this, um, this premiere performance, Smythe's Quartet is placed along Beethoven's uh, G major quartet. And then we also have a, country, a, a few interesting numbers following um, two quartet movements from Joseph Spate. And then an Australian composer, later resident in America, Percy Granger, who 
whose quartet movement based on an Irish reel is also featured in the program. Um, but uh, sort of more recent appraisals of Smythe's quartet, uh, we really uh, see this tussle between thinking of it in terms of form and in terms of history of the string quartet and these sort of uh, feminist meanings. So in 1959, for example, Kathleen Dale suggested it's a closely reasoned quartet the composer's uh, zooms covering up all my little covering up my text here. The composer's finest piece of abstract music uh, in the finale, an interesting blend of sonata form and fugue, which the composer considered one of her best movements. She maintained an even balance between form and content. And then perhaps at the other end of the spectrum, Elizabeth Wood, writing in 1997, says this is her most ra radical composition associated with the suffrage movement. Um, then in 2000, in Amy Ziegler's 2009 thesis, she suggests the equality with which Smythe treats each section suggests the democratic goals of the women's movement um, and also further suggests that it perhaps re represents a British musical style in comparison to the avant-garde composers on the continent, one that is chromatic and modal, but also that incorporates classical forms and the dance-like qualities associated with British folk music. And then Laura Seddon in her very recent book um, suggests that it's a reflection of two neighbouring periods in Smythe's life, her exposure to traditional masculine forms and her newfound collective expression of feminist ideals. And like Leah, I, um, I recommend, you know, listening closely to the fourth movement in particular. That was also um, a uh, I think um, I'll, I'll, um, I won't read this out in detail. Um, Leah's already um, shown us what's, how Smythe described her own quartet. But um, just to say that this combination of thinking about it as abstract, um, abstract music and about the form being foremost, uh, combined with this idea of the feminist politics was very much implicit in Smythe's own framing of her work. So it's no surprise that that has also been um, the discourse in analysing it retrospectively. <clears throat> but there's one further element that the reception of Smythe String Quartet draws our attention to, and that is highlighted by a, a critique from Vienna's Neue Freie Presse after the 1913 performance by the Rosé Quartet. The critic, the critic Julius Korngold, wrote that in the fourth movement of the quartet, Smythe journeys into the English colonies to fetch bizarre comical dances. And you can see the excerpt up there um, in German on the screen. It's a sort of um, interesting one to translate into English, this idea of bizarre and tanzhumor. Um, Smythe then, Smythe's own sort of um, account of that uh, appraisal says, um, that he says I've gone to the colonies apparently. I suppose he thinks it cakewalk or ragtime or tango, none of which horrors I know. This critique I think brings us back to the question of what might constitute Britishness and reminds us that, that the place of Britain in the world could be argued to be defined as much by its colonizing presence and by the many cultural influences that its imperial agenda had brought into English society, as it could by any singular cultural identity. This reference to the English colonies is my segue to other music we might think about as part, part of the British tradition. Though I'm not taking us to the colony referenced in Smythe's allusion, um, to ragtime and cakewalk music, namely not the Americas, but rather to Australia and the Pacific region. And I read Korngold's comments as hinting at the kind of exoticism of non-British and indeed non-Western European musical traditions that was increasingly influential in music at this time. Indeed, this precise historical moment, 1913, in which Smythe String Quartet premieres in Vienna, is the same year in which Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, with its primitivist modernism, had premiered in Paris. And Korngold's comments and Smythe's response to them hint at differentiation by race and the relative value of different musics that could be heard across the British Empire. That is, Britain not as a unified cultural identity, but Britain as diverse imperial domains. 
This style of discourse about non-white musics as bizarre echoes descriptions of Australian Aboriginal music. For example, one expatriate Australian Dudley Glass, who addressed the British Royal Society of Arts in 1963, stated that Aboriginal people had given little to music with their monotonous song and crude instruments, even though simultaneously he praised a non-Aboriginal composer who had sought to use Aboriginal music as inspiration in his composition. Margaret Sutherland argued in 1938 that there was no need for Australian composers to consciously be Australian, nor need they give their compositions descriptive Australian titles. And the full quote is on the slide there. While some of Sutherland's composer colleagues self-consciously imbued their works with words and musical gestures purporting to depict Aboriginal culture as a way to make them distinctly Australian, Sutherland considered this, quote, just some sort of pastiche. But while Sutherland rejected the mimicking of Indigenous musics, this was not a refusal to engage with the specifics of place and the country she lived in. On the contrary, unlike many of her contemporaries, Margaret Sutherland directly engaged with Aboriginal people as collaborators and colleagues. She mentored and formed enduring professional relationships with Aboriginal artists, in particular the Aboriginal tenor Harold Blair. Sutherland was a thought leader and a distinctive and important voice in Australian music and particularly in a local modernist practice. And like many Australian musicians, Sutherland spent a formative period in London between 1923 and 1925 studying with Arnold Bax. It's clear that she saw developing composition, compositional trends in Britain as forward-looking in contrast to the German tradition. And Ethel Smythe's work was evaluated within this frame. After hearing a performance of Smythe's Mass, Sutherland appraised it as not wonderful, but sincere composition in the German style and years behind the modern English school. Where Smythe then studied in Germany and brought this training to bear on building an English musical tradition, Sutherland, from her colonial outsider perspective, looked in at both the German and the English traditions and judged one as steeped in and weighed down by that tradition and the other as moving towards something new. There is then also a politics of race and nation at play, both in how Smythe is regarded abroad as an English composer and whether her music has too many Germanic influences to be regarded as a contributor to the English Renaissance, or whether, as Korngold claimed, that a hint of primitivism or Orientalism, that is, the evocation of music from the English colonies, could somehow reinforce her Englishness from the viewpoint, of course, of Vienna. For Margaret Sutherland's part, her string quartet was strongly positioned by her as British rather than distinctively Australian and was reviewed as a virile work um, which reflects the modern spirit. It was premiered at the British Music Society, albeit in Melbourne, but not only that, she submitted it more than once to the BBC for consideration. Interestingly, she never submitted it to the equivalent Australian broadcaster, the ABC, although she did submit many of her works there and, in fact, was received uh, more positively there than by the BBC, as uh, Sherry Waters-Cohen has shown in her, her PhD thesis. One could argue that this positions this specific work, the String Quartet No. 1, within a British tradition and in dialogue with what she saw as the tussles between German Romanticism and English Modernism. In the early performances of Sutherland's work in Britain, her cultural identity doesn't seem to have taken centre stage. Her work was featured by the Society of Women Musicians, as we have seen, alongside other British composers, well, alongside British composers, as well as French composers. And her violin sonata was closely tied to this mentorship of um, Arnold Bax, whose own work, of course, was influenced by legends from the west of Ireland. So, you know, maybe we could talk about that in the context of Britishness. Um, and her lectures, um, her lecture to the Society of Women Musicians about features of modern composition seems to have been free of any nationalist overtones in a way that Smythe's lecture on British opera was not. But as time went on, Sutherland's work in Britain took on the suggestion that it evoked her Australianness, as can be seen by, uh, from this program in 1951. Again, a performance at the Society of Women Musicians, 
uh, which suggested that um, though her violin sonata was composed in Britain in 1925, it had been, quote, acutely influenced by nostalgia for her native land. And this, I have to say, is fascinating because of the, there's a very strong narrative in Australian music uh, at this time, but particularly the sort of early decades of the 20th century, of nostalgia for the motherland, that the idea that England is the homeland um, to which all artists um, eventually journey. And there's a strong na travel narrative of composers going home sometimes or going to the motherland. So this idea is flipped here that the, the sonata composed in England is about nostalgia for her native land. So I'm sure I've used all my time already. I'm sorry if I'm over time. And so I'll conclude here by returning to the Society of Women Musicians and our central theme of string quartets. The Society uh, founders, Edgar, uh, Catherine Egger and Marion Scott, thought that perhaps women often did not compose string quartets because of the continuing value placed on feminine attributes such as modesty and prudence. But by contrast, Margaret Sutherland saw chamber music as a more appealing form for women composers. And much in the vein of some of the discussion that Leah has um, drawn our attention to. She said, I love the intimacy of writing for a small group of musicians rather than for a big orchestra. I suppose this is reasonable. Women don't seem to go in for tackling epics. And Sutherland was confident that women composers might have something to add to the newest directions in modern music. In her view, women composers had a real contribution to make to how art was conceptualised. She said, I become more and more convinced that the phase of extreme realism introduced into creative music during the last 30 years will possibly find its corrective and regain its balance through the advent of the woman composer. So the case studies of these two women composers evidence the diversity of views among women about the very act of composing string quartets and creating spaces for their performance, about the political act of being a woman composer and, uh, and of how a life devoted to music should fit within a broader politics and about, um, about developments in British music and um, British music as modern music. It's timely that along with increased opportunities we now have to hear the works of women composers that we think also about national categories and how we can understand the historical and present context for our musical cultures. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Amanda. What a, a extraordinary blend of so many intricate threads of indigeneity and nationalism and almost a transactional Australianness and, and Britishness. So, so wonderful to hear, to hear all that. I have lots and lots of questions, but I'm not going to ask the first one because I used up that card previously. So, uh, Leah, would you like to, to ask a question? And please, um, audience members, um, pitch your questions in the Q&A box on, on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Yeah, I can absolutely ask a question. Thank you so much for a really fascinating paper. Um, it's so interesting, and, and I'm sorry for uh, for using up the uh, the Smythe quote about the omelette. <laughs> um, so I was, <laughs> I was wondering um, if you could say a little more about Smythe's quite imperial outlook and imperialistic outlook and her relationship with the suffragettes. And I wonder whether women like Emmeline Pankhurst are sort of influencing her in that way and the sort of impact that that might have on her music and the way she's writing um, because she doesn't you know go in for orientalism she she isn't part of this sort of school as was pointed out um, that does sort of move in that direction um, but particularly the kind of very imperial feminism almost that the Pankhurst mm -hmm. subscribed to is it really made me think about that with this quote um as she's writing to Pankhurst and this I think what Elizabeth would cause an unexamined racism in Smythe's work keeps crumping up over and over again um so yeah I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the possible relationship between um that perspective and uh her involvement with the suffragettes um as well as sort of the impact on her composition um that you've already talked about thank you thanks Leah terrific question um yeah, um, well, I suppose one of the, you know, 
the really interesting, I think, you, you know, your description of the suffragettes as, as sort of having this imperial objective you know, it's it's very evident that there's a real, a very clear clear class dimension to um, the sort of upper and middle class um, or upper middle class orientation of, of those involved in the suffragettes and also their commitment to the kind of objectives of the nation so that, so that when war comes, you know, the, with some exceptions, they're happy to sort of step back and, and let the nation focus on the war effort rather than pursuing the ongoing struggle for for women's rights which i think you know is a is a, you know a fascinating dimension of that movement and of course there were other women's movements in britain um, who took a very different approach with smythe in terms of her composition i mean it's it's hard to see um it's hard to avoid i suppose the opportunism which is possibly an unkind word to use for Smythe, but really just this persistent lifelong attempt to do what needed to be done to have her music um, sit in dialogue with other conversations happening in music and to be into the public. And it, for, uh, what I see in that is, is, you know, a sort of experimentation with so many different styles of composition and genres. Uh, and, you know, there's that one of her, one of the famous quotes from her, which I probably misquote is something like, um, I should have composed a concerto for comb and you might know the second instrument comb and something, you know, maybe that would have done the trick, you know, so she's sort of always searching for what's going to be that thing that will make me, you know, will bring me the recognition, recognition I deserve. And in fact, although, you know, one wouldn't say that Orientalism is a big feature of her composition, her chamber songs, which, um, which were also written about this song had this incredible resonance with, um, French Impressionism and um, and that Orientalism and she claims in one of her books that Debussy came to a concert of them in 1908 and that he thought them wonderful and they're very evocative of some of that you know I mean we can imagine I suppose when she says cakewalk maybe she's thinking of Debussy and um, so I think um, I think she'll try you know she tried lots of things and I'm not sure I'm not sure we can sort of put her in any particular box in terms of compositional style. So, but yeah, it's a very interesting question to think about. Thank you so much for that. Terrific. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Leah. Joanna, over to you. Question number two. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I now have three things to talk about because I just was interested in the conversation as well about Orientalism because I, mean, I think that this is like something I, I haven't you know, I haven't had a chance to fully explore, but it seems like there is a sort of women are involved in British women composers are involved in this sort of Orientalist expression at this time. And there's this vogue for the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam and um, Bantok does a big work of it. But then there's also like Liza, the um, Liza Lehman composers like that who are doing it. So it's interesting. And I think there's also um, th there's a sort of a, a cakewalk performance that is um traveling around at this point in britain as well so but and um, anyway sorry to um just sort of drone on but um i wanted to ask two questions so um one was um first of all i was um struck by the wonderful compliment virility about the quartets and i wondered if you could say something about if this is this a sort of particular kind of um overarching kind of framework for saying what makes a good quartet or is this sort of um a particular thing about modern um quartets that this is coming out um and also with the issues of empire that you were just uh, that you were raising and um the you know both the engagement with you know um sort of um, aboriginal music that you talked about and but, but also what we do with this today, because it seems like often in British music studies, we're very bad at thinking outside of the sort of Little England and, and you know, actually thinking about the elements of empire that means that Margaret Sutherland was a British citizen or a British subject and that that didn't change till 1949. So I also just wanted to um, vaguely ask, you know, how should we how should we be approaching this now what should we be doing more of so that we have this pi this picture 
of British music in this period that really fully recognises the extent um, to, of what's going on throughout the British Empire. Thanks, thanks, Joe. I mean, that's um, it's kind of you, kind of you to ask me that, but I sort of feel like you know that's such a, such a big question for everybody. Um, um, and and it's tricky, I suppose, because there is a very strong um, sense of there being a clear distinction between. It's not that Australian um, composers at this time didn't see themselves as Australian. In, in fact, there was this very strong push to create an Australian national identity, but this complicated relationship that um, results from being um, a British subject, I think, does open up this category of Britishness in interesting ways. And it does seem remarkable. I, I think, and it probably continues today, there's this ongoing sense that Australians were constantly thinking of the motherland and thinking of Britain, but very likely um, British music was thinking very little of, of Australian, you know, what was happening in Australian composers. And I'm sure that's, um, that could be mapped onto lots of the ongoing and former colonies of Britain. But of course, then we also increasingly see migration into Britain from those um, imperial outposts that then complicates um, what, what British music becomes. And I think that's um, sort of, um, a topic that I think is more in Florian's domain that I think he's going to take us there soon. Um, just to go back to, but yes, I suppose what I'm saying is I think it it can, it it has to be accounted for somewhere in there that that somehow through all this time, the, the British world is so much more than than um, you know an island, and in fact the sort of far corners that that domain spreads to is somehow. Um, part of this story in interesting ways. Um, and I, I just wanted to make a quick note, the, the comment you started with that, of course, all the um, the international expositions and exhibitions that are happening in this period, especially from sort of 18, late 1890s through these decades, I think is a very interesting part of this story about these sort of on Orientalist influences and that sort of thing. Um, and then the other question you asked was about virility. And I think this is a really interesting one. I mean, I sort of I, I had part, I was going to talk more about this and I thought, oh, that's just another, another uh, you know, tangent that I shouldn't go down. But that word virile and virility does come up remarkably often in reviews of women composers' work at this time. And I think it's the kind of thing that Leah was referring to even in um, contemporary reviews of women, this sense of surprise that um, there can be something strong or forceful or large scale or virile that um, that needs to be commented on. And it's very common in reviews of some of the um, other composers, especially in the late 19th century. Augusta Holmes always gets those kind of reviews about her music being virile and um, Louisa Adolphe Le Ball. There's a few, there's a few different people who get this kind of this um, characterization as virile quite often. Um, I think with Sutherland's music that happens less often, but there's something about this element of surprise that seems to be being evoked there in, oh goodness, they can, you know, women can do that kind of thing, can they? There's something, something going on there. We could have a whole other conversation about that, I think. Something I was interested in, Amanda, um, was this idea of, of all my, you know, the boundaries of Britishness, but also the transactional nature, if, if that's not too vulgar a, a word to use. And I, I, I have here a few phrases that Melbourne was referred to from the late 19th century through to about the mid 20th century, you know, marvellous Melbourne, uh, musical Melbourne, uh, second city of empire, and then the rot set in and it became the seventh city of empire. And I mean, I, I, I don't know who coined those terms. I don't know whether they were earnest, earnest minded locals who were British expats or whether these were inventions by 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 foreigners or by by people of empire or colonial um, administrators who wanted to make Melbourne rise above its primitiveness, and I wondered if any of this these discourses even remotely made their way into advertising or description of the, the musical events in and around Melbourne, particularly that Southern was Sutherland was involved with. Now, that's a pretty broad question, I know, but these this this sort of beefing up Melbourne to be more than it perhaps was, I just think is, is quite interesting from a colonial, in post-colonial point of view, looking back at the period. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting, Paul. And I don't know that 
answer that that sounds like a great um line of inquiry uh you know how you know, how much these sorts of phrases are being used in in advertising these sorts of performances but what i will say is that these there's this very strong sense, I think, especially in the 1930s and 40s, which is um, a time when the Australian Broadcasting Commission um, is trying to form a national school of composition in Australia um, and really fostering, employing composers on its staff to be full-time employees and really kind of generating this, that that even though there's this sense of a, a, a wanting to create a local tradition, there's always, um, that's always being validated with reference to Britain. So, um, so one of the iconic moments in Australian music is the composition of the work Corroboree by John Antill in the 1940s. And this is kind of plucked out of obscurity by Eugene Goosens. And so the fact of having this com this conductor come to Australia and tap on the shoulder, the kind of, the, co the composer who's gonna be the one, you know, he's gonna kind of take us into an Australian musical tradition is just such an enormous part of this founding story of Australian music. So there's this, uh, that, that um, phrase you mentioned about the second city of empire or whatever, or the seventh or whatever it is, I think it's not necessarily about Melbourne. I mean, Antil's based in Sydney, mm -hmm. as is Goose for most of the time. Um, but this sense of, you know, um, always looking for guidance about what should be the direction we take, even though all of the rhetoric is about creating an Australian tradition. Yeah. Thank you. That's going be a different gonna... question. No, no, no. It, it, it's all related. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's fascinating. I could, you know, talk for hours, but I won't. And our final question is from uh, Alexander Douglas, who's struggling a bit with Wi-Fi. So I hope Alexander can, can stick around. Um, uh, Alexander asks about uh, this unexamined racism in Smythe, um, but I'm concerned about the specific, specificity of language that uh, we use at this time. Intersectionality is becoming a big issue, but we do but do we always talk about it in useful ways? And do we see resonances now about the practices of paternalism in music academia and the music industry by Anglo-European females? Question mark. Also, I'm very intrigued by this idea of notional creative praxis hierarchy in which the one who creates is on a different plane to the one who realizes or interprets, a la Gunther Schuller. Um, and from an aesthetics point of view, how does this concept of the ontology of creativity play into the concerns of this conversation okay well there's a there's a lot there i'm still digesting that question maybe i'll tackle the second part first um, which is this idea of a notional creative practice hierarchy and this is something that in terms of you know women composers which is the main theme of what i'm talking about today is very strongly articulated in this time that we might we might uh, we we've long recognised women's interpretive ability, but that the act of creation is considered to be beyond them. And in this sort of repetitive history making that we were talking about earlier, this is the kind of constant narrative there that, for the first time, we see a composer not just an interpreter. That I mean, you could you could cut and paste that phrase into reviews across Europe um, for decades and decades when women composers works are performed. So there's a very, um, in, we could also open up a bigger discussion about the, the, the role of the, the um, genius male composer in the 19th century that I think is strongly influential here in thinking about what, a, what a composer looks like, but also, um, also what you have, how, how fully one has to devote oneself to music to properly be a composer. And that's where this sort of political engagement becomes very complicated for women composers, because if they're seen to be political, they're, they're not really doing it right. They're not, you know, fully giving themselves over to the point of complete physical demise to the music. And so um, that's a very complicated position to be in when just, as Ethel Smythe would say, when just the struggle to to be a composer at all, to have your works performed required some kind of political engagement. It wasn't possible to just sort of, you know, send your music out there and hope for the best. Um, I don't know, the, the, the question about um, intersectionality and 
talking about unexamined racism is a very big thing. Uh, I'm trying to think how to tackle that in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, I suppose, I mean, I suppose what I will say is that I think that there's, I, I hear a lot, especially in relation to Australian music, that we shouldn't sort of judge the past by our contemporary lenses of looking at you know what we now expect in terms of intersectionality or what we now expect in terms of diversity um that that we can't expect of the past what we expect now in the present but the focus of my work has been to show how even at the time for example in australia um, we have this big tradition of um, non-indigenous composers representing aboriginal music in their works but um, my book, which Paul mentioned that I published last year, what I've sought to do there is show all the ways in which Aboriginal people were actually trying to perform publicly as well. So that even while we have non-Indigenous composers flying the flag and saying we're exposing Aboriginal music to the world, at that very same time, Aboriginal musicians were also trying to rep represent themselves. And so it really complicates the idea that we should judge things in different ways because it depends whose voice we're listening to. Actually, when we look at what Aboriginal people were saying in the 1930s, it's not very different from what they're saying now, which is we have, it's it's up to us to represent our own culture and we're here to do it and, and wanting to do it. So I'm not sure if that's really what Alexander's question is getting to, um, but that's the answer I'll give for now in the, you know, not wanting to take up too much of the session time. That's okay. And I, I um... Alexander says, thanks very much. And I'm sure if you both wanted to uh, to continue this conversation, you, you could well do so after this symposium. Um, lots of rich, rich material there. Amanda, thank you so much for a really riveting talk. And uh, you've got us all, all, all thinking. It's, it's wonderful. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Now, our third speaker uh, is Florian Shedding who is, uh, is going to focus on a specific episode in relation to Marcia Sieber's string quartets. And uh, Sieber variously represented Britain abroad with his quartets at ISCM events, but faced considerable obstacles to having these same works performed or broadcast in the UK. Florian suggests a point could be made about how UK institutions had very different views of how they wanted Britain to be heard. And thus defined, and thus defined abroad as well as at home. And Florian suggests this was an experience shared by several other immigrant composers. This paradoxical treatment, in turn, might have historiographical ramifications for our views of what national music history, British or any other, actually is. Now, Florian studied at the universities of Hamburg in Germany, Salamanca, Spain, and Royal Holloway in the UK. In 2007, he was a postdoc fellow at Humboldt University, Berlin. Uh, before joining Bristol, Florian was lecturer and research fellow at the University of Southampton. He served on the AHRC Peer Review College and he's editor of the RMA Research Chronicle. His research focuses on music and migration, especially the displacement of European music so musicians caused by the catastrophes that characterized the 20th century is published on migratory music in all its forms, spanning various genres from functional to popular to art musics. His work has been published in numerous edited collections, journals, encyclopedias, and elsewhere. Florian, welcome. And we're really looking forward to what you've got to say about Sieber, if I pronounced thank it correctly. You. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Paul. Um, and uh, Joe, thank you for having me. And uh, Leia and Amanda, um, it's been a privilege to hear your superb papers and you sure are tough acts uh, to follow. Everybody, I do not have a slideshow. Um, it's uh, just me. So if you can't see any slides, it's because there aren't any. Migration is a divisive topic. Scholars and academics like ourselves are usually sympathetic to migrants. Many of us are attracted to notions of pluralism and diversity, diversity being, after all, in the headline of this event, um, cosmopolitanism and liberalism. While scholars arguing against migration do exist, they are far and few between. 
In public discourses beyond the academy, conversely, migration has had a fair bit of bad press lately. Responses to international crises, such as the current corona pandemic, have led to a heightening of nationalist language and to a proliferation of border closures. What unites both discourses is that migration is at times constructed, narrated or imagined as the other to the national. The reality, of course, isn't quite so antagonistic. Throughout the 20th century, British national culture was influenced profoundly by immigrant artists and musicians. British music history is unthinkable without migration and without immigrants. Their impact may not consistently be on the surface, but it is consistently a factor. And before I begin, let me exemplify the importance of migration for the story of British music in a perfectly straightforward um, case. Since this is a symposium dedicated to the string quartet, let's start there and consider the most famous British quartets of them all. The Amadeus Quartet consisted of violinists Norbert Brynin and Sigmund Nissel, violist Peter Shidloff and Martin Lovett on the cello. The first three, as I'm sure everybody knows, were refugees from Vienna after Austria's annexation by Hitler Germany. And rumor has it, in fact, that Brynin, Nissel and Shidloff met as so-called enemy aliens in an internment camp on the Isle of Man. And it is this historical background against which my paper is set. The European refugees either side of World War II and some of the multiple and varied ways in which they added their voices to the soundscape of mid-century Britain and the history of the string quartet in particular in this context. Apologies, another detour first. For 20th century music, institutions matter. They act as mediators and distributors of music, as commissioning bodies and enablers of musical production. They afford economic, cultural and socio-political capital. They function as crucial actors in cultural organization, re-inscribing and maintaining genre boundaries and seeking to legitimize their own cultural production intent on preserving their status. Institutions then, help create artistic productions and enable them to reach public audiences. But they are also gatekeepers. They decide what gets heard and what does not. And artists who seek to promote their creativity must negotiate these hubs of culture. There is no doubt that the most influential institution for music in 20th century Britain is the BBC. No musicological study on British music over the last century or so is complete without paying at least some attention to the role of the BBC, an assessment that transcends boundaries of genre, class and race. Right from its inception in 1922, the BBC deliberately and intently shaped the nation's tastes, as indeed as it was tasked to do. The BBC was fully aware of its powerful position and conceived of itself as not just a preserver, but a creator of the nation in sound. Attempts to purify the nation from foreign sonic interference were combined with institutional efforts to construct and reinforce what Britain should be imagined to sound like. What about migrants then? If cultural institutions matter for musical life in general, they certainly do so for migrants. For immigrant artists, especially those arriving as refugees, Gaining a foothold in artistic circles is as vital as it is urgent. Migrant musicians rely on institutions not just for employment and economic opportunity. In aiding dissemination of their music, for example, cultural institutions can also be entry points to gain social capital. They act as hubs for migrants and have the potential to provide fixed points along the network of migrant flows. Concert organizing institutions, Non-governmental organizations and other cultural entities turn into strategic hubs, which play a crucial role in facilitating migrant voices to be heard. Perhaps it was inevitable that migrant voices had the potential to destabilize the status and endeavors of the BBC. In a very fundamental sense, the BBC as an institution was shaping, but also struggling with the politics of sound. As we will see, the BBC sought maybe not to exclude migrant voices, but certainly con to control and contain them. In this paper, I concentrate on the BBC's paradoxical and at times almost schizophrenic treatment of immigrant musicians 
My focus is the case of Matthias Scheiber, who arrived in the UK in 1935 and sought, like well nigh all composers of the period, to establish a foothold in the BBC. I'm interested in the seemingly inconsistent ways in which the BBC benefited from Scheiber's expertise on the one hand and responded to his lobbying to have his works broadcast on the other. An investigation of Scheiber's involvement with the BBC provides a representative insight into the paradoxical manner in which it handled the music of immigrants more broadly. First of all, there is no doubt that the BBC provided more employment opportunities to migrant musicians than any other institution in mid-century Britain. Just like Bertolt Goldschmidt or Hans Keller or Gersh Mikesh, for instance, Scheiber belonged to a large group of migrants whose abilities as musicologists, musicians, composers and conductors influenced the BBC's broadcasts during the war in particular, especially in the overseas services. These migrants took on jobs as session musicians and rehearsal conductors, authors of programs and composers of arrangements. Some could also be heard on air introducing musical programs so they weren't just backroom staff. The refugees' influence was maybe greatest in the overseas services, especially in the European programs, propaganda stations aimed at the countries they had fled from. From the mid-1940s onwards, Scheiber too could often be heard on the BBC's European service. This included programs in German and Hungarian, often announcing and introducing music banned by fascist regimes across the continent, such as Arnold Schoenberg, but also British composers, notably Benjamin Britten. At the same time, the records clearly show that the BBC was reluctant to engage Scheiber for home broadcasts. The bulk of work he did was for foreign audiences. Part of the reason for the BBC's uneasy compromise between employing immigrants for its European service while largely excluding them from significant contributions to the home service may have been the scrutiny the corporation was under. Many in the British musical establishment had long been critical of the BBC's lack of programming of British music as they perceived it, especially during Edward Clarke's time at the corporation. Well networked internationally, Clark had been an advocate of the European avant-garde, especially Schoenberg, until his resignation in 1936. In 1940, an open letter signed by a who is who of the British musical establishment severely attacked the BBC for not playing enough music by our own native composers, as they put it. Adrian Bolt was tasked to write a reply. Aiming to justify the BBC's programming, he referred to an average of 10 performances of British works of a serious character each week. In the field of light music, Bolt counted pieces by British composers amounting to 43% of total broadcast time. The signatories of the complaint, however, were not satisfied, and I quote, out of every 22 hours of serious music provided today, 18 are given over to the foreigner. It is inconceivable that any fair-minded listener will consider this to be an adequate recognition of native music." End of quote. The BBC caved in. Shortly afterwards, a short note informed the public that the BBC would exclude music by composers of Nazi sympathies and old works that can be interpreted in terms of modern Germany, as they put it. Furthermore, all vocal works from now on had to be sung in English. Rather than blacklisting only Nazi affiliated music, however, the BBC's ban went considerably further. Internal and confidential lists were compiled and circulated amongst editors that named specific composers whose works were not to be broadcast. Initially, this included just over 300 Austrian and German born composers. In August 1940, numbers increased to 365, now also including Italians. Disturbingly, about a quarter of all banned composers were, in fact, refugees from fascism. In many cases, the BBC blacklist included the same names that could be found on Nazi lists of degenerate music. Kurt Weil, Erich Wolfgang Korngold, Arnold Schönberg, Alexander von Zemlinski, Hans Eisler and Paul Hindemith, for example, were migrant composers who were blacklisted at some point. Several more lived in Britain, such as Egon Welles. Absurdly, some were actually employed by the BBC, such as Bertolt Goldschmidt. That composers such as Alban Berg and Gustav Mahler also featured on the list testifies to an approach that was at best insensitive. At worst, 
the inclusion of Jewish composers in an exercise which claims to aid the fight against Nazi Germany testifies to an undercurrent of anti-Semitism in British musical life. Internal records show that several BBC editors criticized the ban on alien composers, but obeyed it loyally. The BBC loosened the ban somewhat in March 1941 and allowed several programme editors to use works of enemy composers, as they were called, if they could prove that there were no alternatives available by British composers. The list was constantly revised but, revised, but I have been unable to discover a record in the BBC archives that suggests that the blacklisting ever officially ended. An employee of the corporation who wishes to remain anonymous informed me that it was still in place during the 1970s. Matthias Scheiber was not included on the BBC's list of blacklisted composers, but even so, the treatment he received by the institution suggests a practice of test blacklisting, scheduling his works for broadcasts to foreign listeners, but preventing them from reaching British audiences. Indeed, the BBC almost exclusively transmitted migrant works on the European service, as I've already mentioned. And these broadcasts in the European service afforded migrants a considerable role in Britain's propaganda war abroad, but they could hardly promote those same composers in Britain. To be considered for the home service, composers had to submit their works to a reading panel. If the panel approved the work, it was suggested for broadcast. The number of works by immigrant composers accepted by the panel between Hitler's takeover in 1933 and one year after the war, 1946, is negligible. Reliable records for chamber music do, do not exist, but only six orchestral compositions by immigrant composers were accepted and broadcast prior to the outbreak of World War II. Two of them are arrangements of other works. Four, the other four can be categorized as light music. Large numbers of composers went entirely um, unheard. During World War II itself, the BBC employed scores of migrants, but did not broadcast a single orchestral work by an immigrant to British audiences. Such, such practices of silencing migrant voices happened in a public discourse in which, on the whole, Britain publicly presented herself as hospitable to refugees. For example, in 1933, a group of 20 prominent British scientists urged the government to, quote, make it clear that those whose intellects are to be accounted as among the finest in Germany today would find here safe refuge and opportunities for continued activity, end of quote. The British administration was more cautious. We do not admit that there's a, a right of asylum, as the government put it, but when we have to decide whether a particular political refugee is to be given admission to this country, we have to base our decision on whether it is in the public interest that he be admitted, end of quote. Between 1933 and 1945, almost 70 composers came to Britain, as did some 400 musicians. Musicians had never been the most welcome refugees, and in March 1938, in the wake of the Anschluss and the year of the Degenerate Music Exhibition in Nazi Germany, the Foreign Office decreed, quote, minor musicians and commercial artists of all kind as unsuitable for entry, end of quote. With the beginning of the war in 1939, a tightening in British immigration policy took place, with the Churchill government seeking to prevent all refugees from entering the country. Now, attention turned to those already on British soil and the government explored ways of removing migrants from public life. After the fall of France in 1940, the government feared that migrants might be covert agents seeking to prepare the ground for Nazi invasion. Tribunals were set up across the country to assess the case of over 70,000 refugees. Despite re recommendations to intern only 600, less than 1% of the total number, and despite public assurances that foreigners would not be interned, Churchill decided to intern all male adult Germans, Austrians and Italians in the summer of 1940. Estimates are that some 27,000 refugees finished up in camps. Several were deported to Canada and Australia, an operation in which almost 700 refugees lost their lives when in July 1940, the Arandora Star was bombarded and sunk by German U-boats on its way to Canada. But let's get back to the BBC. And let's get, let's turn to string quartets. Matthias Scheiber's case is in many ways representative for that of other immigrant composers. After the success of second, Scheiber's second string quartet at the ISCM festival in New York in 1941, which was, as Scheiber reported proudly, successful enough to receive a repeat performance during the festival, 
Scheiber hoped that the BBC might be interested in a broadcast of the quartet on the, on the home service. This made sense because the quartet had been submitted by the British section of the ISCM as the official British entry alongside Benjamin Britten's Les Illuminations, even though Scheiber was at the time not a naturalized British citizen. Strikingly, while considered appropriate to represent the nation in sound abroad, the BBC's panel prevented the quartet from reaching British listeners. And indeed, I'd love to play an extract of the quartet, but copyright, pre copyright prevents me, the irony. The corporation thus had different guidelines of what it wished Britain to sound like abroad and at home to foreign and native audiences. European broadcasts, for example, proved consistently more diverse with more immigrant works on air. It's almost as though different British art musics exist in the in mid 20th century, one of diversity abroad and a narrower one at home. The international image of the cosmopolitan, open-minded and hospitable nation contrasted with portrayals of mono-ethnicity at home. Scheiber's internationally successful second quartet was for the time a highly progressive avant-garde work, combining a consistent 12-tone approach with new objectivity style integration of jazz idioms. And Scheiber felt that that might, might be where perhaps the problem was. After all, anti-modernist attitudes were common in Britain's musical establishment mid 20th century as he perceived it. Despite the efforts of younger composers like William Walton and Benjamin Britten, Elgar's late romantic pathos and the Celtic nationalism of Arnold Bax largely epitomized British musical style at this time, and little had changed since London's Royal College of Music had refused Benjamin Britten a grant to study with Alban Berg in Vienna in the early 1930s. In his efforts to have his works broadcast to British listeners, Scheiber submitted increasingly lighter music until in 1944, he proffered, somewhat cynically one might think, his incidental composition, Transylvanian Rhapsody for Salon Orchestra, portraying himself almost like a hung Hungarian cliche and self-orientalizing his migrant identity. Like all other submissions, the Rhapsody, which had previously been broadcast on the European service was rejected as unsuitable for the home service. With the launch of the BBC's third program in 1946, which aimed specifically to reach highbrow audiences, Scheiber hoped that his music might now have gained a platform for broadcast and resubmitted his second string quartet. His hopes were disappointed, however, and the quartet was rejected, as were all other works he submitted. In a letter to Herbert Morrill, then in the BBC's music department, Scheiber gave expression to his anger, issuing an open accusation that he was being discriminated against. And here's a long quote from this letter. I think it is a rather sad state of affairs that a work cannot be broadcast even in the third program because there is supposedly too small an audience for it. I always thought that this is exactly about which the third need not worry. Here's the strange case that my second string quartet, which was good enough to be selected first by the British, then by the international jury and performed at an ICM festival, a work which is played by the Roth Quartet in America, by the Gertles in Brussels, by the Tatra in Budapest, by the Lenzewski in Germany, cannot be broadcast in the country where I live and work. Heaven knows I have written enough works which, far from being radical or dissonant, are immediately attractive and effective. But not even those works are ever being broadcast here, although, again, they are more frequently played abroad. I don't think I'm given to suffering from persecution mania, but I feel something must be wrong somewhere. Otherwise, I cannot explain this continual neglect of my works by the BBC." End of quote. A week and a half, Murrell sent a diplomatically worded response stating that, quote, there is no resistance here against the broadcast performance of your works, and we try not to discriminate against any particular style or composer. End of quote. But the decision stood. After the BBC's refusal to broadcast his third quartet, the so-called Quartetto Lyrico, Scheiber gave up. And incidentally, you will be able to hear this very quartet uh, on Wednesday, I think it is, in the concert um, associated uh, with this, with this um, um, symposium. In a letter to the BBC, he categorically stated that he would never again offer his compositions and submit to this humiliating procedure, as he termed it. An internal BBC note shortly thereafter from head of music for the third program, Leonard Isaacs, to the reading panel sums up the BBC's attitude towards Scheibe's progressive music. I quote, 
I have the greatest respect for his workmanship and the quartet's shapeliness on paper is undeniable, but its sounds are such that I cannot swallow them. He doesn't seem to mind what it sounds like." End of quote. Scheibe's third quartet was not broadcast during his lifetime, even when it represented, yet again, Britain abroad, receiving the coveted South African Award of the ISCM at the 1955 Baden-Baden Festival. Scheibe's case thus illustrates well the workings of the institution in practice. As acts of bordering and silencing contrasted with offers of real opportunity, my focus on Scheibe shows how the BBC functioned as a border agent of the nation in sound. As a national public broadcaster, the BBC defined its role in nationalizing sound and securing the national oral border. At the same time, the BBC operated an international and wide ranging networks of propaganda services during World War II, which were effectively run by immigrants, thus transmitting a hybrid multitude of voices to global audiences. And yet, these same voices were restricted from broadcasting to British listeners. This dichotomy itself is mirrored in the BBC's treatment of immigrant voices, which veered constantly between marginalization and access, and which form a backdrop to the wider context of what it meant to be an immigrant musician in mid-century Britain. After the end of the war, particularly from the 1950s onwards, the picture loses some of its bleakness. In any case, the musicians who Hitler forced to leave the continent and who migrated to Britain engaged in a plethora of activities and thus, in the end, enriched British musical life. Some of the migrant composers impacted more upon British music life than others, of course. Some became successful teachers of a future generation of composers, others didn't. Some developed new interests and excelled in them or didn't. Others never changed their style much, yet others stopped composing for a while or forever. Whether there's a clear pattern in all this is a different matter. But maybe there does not need to be a pattern. After all, cultural richness and diversity are one of the hallmarks of the Weimar Republic from where many of these composers came. And music historians tend to regard this complexity and diversity as a virtue. Maybe we can make similar assessments for the bewildering array of activities of migrant musicians that is reflected in the rich history of the string quartet in 20th century Britain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian. Another really um, incredibly um, fascinating paper of networks and prejudice and national identity and, and everything in between. Um, some really extraordinary stuff there, quite unbelievable. But anyway, thank you, Florian. It was just, just terrific. Our first question um, comes from the, uh, Lee Dalivi. Dunleavy, who writes, I'm a choral conductor and have been introducing my choirs to music outside what might be considered the established canon over the past year. Dr. Broad kindly spoke to us about Smythe and we shared a wonderful photo of her in Salzburg in August 1922 with a large number of refugee musicians, Karl Weigel, Karl Alwyn, Wilhelm Grosch, Paul Lindemann, Rudolf Retti, Paul Pisk, Egon Lustgarten, Egon Veles, Karl Horowitz, Hugo, Holder. It seems that emigre composers thrived post-World War II in the United States in a way which was less obvious in the UK. Might this be in part because of a lack of dominant broadcasting voice such as the BBC? Yes, that, that, is, a, that is a question which on the face of it might seem pretty straightforward, but in fact is extremely difficult to tackle, um, I, I think, because there's so many, so many aspects and variants and approaches one can take. First of all, Lee, uh, well done for choosing this great repertory um, um, and incorporating that in, 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 in your work. I think that's fantastic. So um, I think let me, let me, I'm not going to obviously go through every single aspect of, of possible answer or every single variant of possible answers that I have, but let me just pick up a few. I would say that first of all, migrant musicians in the United States as compared to the United Kingdom have a bigger lobby. Um, and that is um, not insignificantly because the, um, in, in, I mean, in a very 
straightforward way, America is a considerably, the United States is a considerably larger country. They have considerably more universities with considerably more posts to be filled. And uh, during the Second World War, um, there are several prestigious posts that were filled with migrant composers and migrant conductors and migrant musicians. And I suspect that, that we would all be, you know, we would all probably find it quite easy to name at least some names. And so, and of course, they would all, you know, argue the case of their fellow migrants in many cases. I mean, Hans Eisler wins the Oscar for best film music, whatever. Um, um, and I mean, that there's just so many examples. The, the, the kind of, um, if, if you go, if you go into your um, academic um, music teaching at universities in the United States, even now, you can see that, for example, theory and analysis are much more important. Shankirian analysis is much more important, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, there's, so there's a more, there's, there somehow seems to me be, to be a more direct link there. Why exactly this is, whether the United States at this point conceives of itself more as a, as a immigrant nation than the United Kingdom, for example, one can only speculate. There's, a, it, there's certainly a case to be made that in a very crude kind of a way, Jewish refugees aren't African-American. Okay, so there's a hierarchy of, 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 of racism there going on, so to speak. Um, but but it's the, the, the size of the lobby is certainly one factor. Another factor I would say is uh, institutions, yes, but I would say not only broadcasters, but also uh, the um, importance and uh, weight of trade unions. Uh, the United States at this point, the trade union organization in the United States is, let's say, fractious at best whereas the trade unions in the United Kingdom are rather more powerful. They have a bigger lobby with, with, with policy makers and the government at the time, including the, even including the Churchill government. And uh, trade unions lobbied the UK government really hard in the 1930s and 1940s to not allow immigrant musicians specifically to take up posts as musicians. Now that, that again, that in itself was on the back of the death of the silent film which meant that many, many musicians who had had jobs playing in cinemas were suddenly unemployed. So, so, there, so, so there's, there was a feeling that there were not nearly enough musicians to job as it was, and then all these immigrants come in and, 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 and that kind of thing. So trade unions didn't have the same importance in the United States. Um, then the next one is the spectacular rise of the film industry in the United States. Uh, which just, it, it seemed almost couldn't create enough jobs. I mean, there were so many jobs for film music composers all of a sudden in Hollywood, and that absorbed a lot, a lot, a lot of people. And of course, in the United Kingdom, at the same time, the film industry is not necessarily in decline, although it soon will be in the 1950s, but certainly is just, above keep, just about keeping its head above water. There are many, many more attempts. I haven't got the one answer, but they're, they're just some pointers. Thanks, Florian. And thanks, Lee, for your question. Our next question comes from Laura Tunbridge. Did Schreiber work, Schreiber, sorry for my very bad German pronunciation. Um, that's mine, not, not Laura's, apologies, my body. Uh, did Schreiber work with a particular quartet? Did any groups in Britain have his music in the, in the repertoire? Well, the third quartet, which we, you will hear um, during this uh, symposium, the Quartet Lyrica, was written for the Amadeus. Um, and they, um, they, they recorded it. Um, I can't remember whether they did the world premiere, but they certainly did the pr British premiere. Uh, it has to be said that they didn't much like it. Um, they, they were, they, they, I think they were rather, uh, rather more, they had a more traditional musical outlook perhaps. Uh, but the, um, but in terms of, the, I mean, I would say the Amadeus Quartet as far as the, as far as the third quartet is concerned. Uh, but beyond that, perhaps, thank you for your question, Laura. Um, Scheiber worked very prolifically with um, musicians in Britain, both with migrant backgrounds and not migrant backgrounds. Um, he, he wrote uh, numerous pieces uh, specifically for Peter Pierce, uh, for example, um, who is probably the most prominent 
uh, um, most prominent of them. So, so yeah, so, so collaborating with musicians that he knew and that he had met variously through the BBC, through Morley College um, and through other um, activities that, that was definitely, yeah. They, they were all purposefully written for people, those works, the majority of them. Thanks, thanks, Florian and, and Laura. Um, keep the questions coming. I have one in the meantime. And Florian, you mentioned that there was a reading panel in, in play. Do we know who was on it? Who chaired it? And how, and how did it work? Was it, was it sort of a majority vote or was there power of veto by a, chair, a chairman, chair, chairperson at all? How, do you know how the sort of logistics and mechanics of that, that panel worked? Well, the makeup of the panel in terms of who's on it uh, changed, of course, over time, um, pretty regularly. Uh, but we do know who was on the reading panel at any one point from internal BBC records. As far as um, the uh, public um, at the time or anyone submitting composer was concerned, it was, it was secret. I mean, we now know because we can go to the BBC archive and find out. But at the time, it was, it was um, well, I don't know, secret, confidential anyway. You couldn't find out who was on the reading panel. Unless, of course, if you were on the reading panel or if you were high up in the BBC hierarchy. Um, the reading panel, as far as I'm aware, um, did not take, did, did not do minutes. That there aren't. I, I haven't. I haven't seen any minutes to any of their meetings. This doesn't mean, of course, that there weren't any minutes, but at least I've never seen any. So it is uh, difficult to assess exactly how decisions were taken, and whether they were done by majority vote or or, or whatever. Um, I rather suspect that. But this is a pure, pure speculation. I rather suspect that they would have got together every so often, gone through them in person without taking notes and saying yes, no, yes, no, et cetera. I don't know. Um, what I can say is that um, several uh, composers, I mean, of course, you know, <laughs> immigrant composers aren't alone in accusing the BBC or not promoting them. This, this, this cuts across well nigh every single composer in, in 20th century Britain, who the BBC is constantly accused for not pro, uh, promoting, um, promoting various people. And uh, what I certainly can say is that organizations such as, for example, the Society for, for the Promotion of New Music um, modeled its reading panel that it had itself on the BBC, uh, but that they made a point of making public who was on the panel and making minutes and making these available. They made a point of providing feedback mm. to those who had oh, submitted. Okay. But I guess, to be honest, as far as the BBC is concerned, I suppose it's a little bit like when we submit a funding application to the AHRC. We don't I was thinking that. that, was just thinking that we don't know how the vote works. Yeah. yeah, and maybe in a few decades time, somebody can go to an archive for minutes or not, but that's, it was much like that. Yeah. Thank you. We have a comment from Alexander Douglas who writes, I really want to thank Florian for, for this paper. It's not possible to offer an adequate summary of the ways in which my thinking about the questions of representation and diversity in BBC programming decisions, programming deci decisions in much more recent times has just taken a major paradigm shift. At present, the axis between aesthetics and ethics seems to have largely avoided questions of politics. This question needs more nuance, but with apologies, can we see a case within this extraordinary narrative you just shared for aesthetics as politics, rather than anything intrinsically objective, in brackets as Adorno with his advocacy for truth in music might have argued? Question mark. Oh, uh, whew, crikey. Is this a good moment to open this up to my fellow panelists? Because I think that's, that's huge to be honest. Joe? Sorry, uh, th this actually ties in nicely with um, what I wanted to ask about. So, I, I mean, I think that there's potentially a more kind of um, run-of-the-mill political ingredient than Adorno's uh, views on aesthetics, which is that some of these emigres are 
f have fled Austria and Germany because they're communists and they were known to be communists and they were um, so Maya, for example, and they were be they were under surveillance. So um, I think yeah. that's an ingredient. Uh, well, it's both an ingredient in the BBC being possibly opposed to them, but also a potential source of opportunity because um, I wondered if you, I was thinking with my um, Alan Bush and British communism hat on of the, some of the opportunities that he tried to um, give to emigre composers so that they'd be working with his working class choirs or they'd be composing pieces for these orchestras put together to offer performing opportunities in wartime. So um, again, no, no favours done to them by with, with the BBC or the Home Office, but um, I, I think that that's also an ingredient. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, thank you, thank you, Joanna, for, for, uh, Joe, for adding, adding this uh, uh, point. You are absolutely right that there was a very committed um, number of, uh, a number of very committed migrants with uh, communist uh, roots or, or, at, or, or let's say at least strongly anti-fascist uh, beliefs and that being the reason for their seeking a refuge. Um, it is also, of course, the case, notwithstanding your important point, that there is no such thing as a migrant community. I mean, this is a vastly diverse group of people in, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of language background, in terms of political belief, in terms of gender, in terms of class, the uh, uh, lot. Uh, so it's um, therefore, hard, I think, also to try and pretend to be able to give any holistic answer to Alexander's question, <laughs> because where, 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 where do I start? I mean, I think, I think, first of all, many, many, Scheiber, for example, uh, knew Adorno. Uh, they collaborated, they worked together, they did a, a, a research project on jazz together. And so, uh, and so, I know, I know, I know, I know pretty in, in, in as much detail, I think, as maybe I care to know uh, how uh, Scheiber felt about Adorno, and how he thought about about his views, and how he how he felt about the connection uh, of aesthetics and, and and politics. And I think that Scheiber's reading of Adorno, possibly conversely to Alexander's reading of Adorno. Scheibe seemed to think that the truth in music was always intrinsically political. Um, and that any music making would always reveal um, systemic societal uh, backgrounds or undercurrents, uh, so to speak. And there are, there's, an, there's an article which Scheiber wrote for The Listener, the kind of mag magazine of the BBC, where he said, the problem of contemporary music is that we are forced to compose music which are not in alignment with societies in the truths. So we're not allowed to write the kind of music that needs to be written, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, can I say, let's just say something else as well, um, Florian. Did I, did I break up then? I think I'm Pardon? Maybe. Pardon? Yes, please, Joe, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I think um, I may have broken up then, I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I would just wanted to add to that on the sort of the BBC readers reports, because I, I mean, I've seen them from like post-war period. I think at some point they started sort of submitting them or something, but I've seen things where they've been talking about, um, of course, I'm... Um, you know, Alan Bush's overtly communist and overtly political operas. And there's sort of, there's a very kind of art for art's sake aesthetic coming in. So the aesthetic evaluation is saying, well, this is like, we're going to give this a demerit aesthetically because of the political content, because this is not the right thing to have in. But also that they might do things like accuse it of not being sophisticated because you have these sort of, um, you know, the kind of comic book goodies and baddies 
in terms of characterization. So um, rather than having Peter Grimes like sophisticated psychological portraits. Um, so, so I think, um, again, the, the questions of aesthetics and politics become very blurred on both sides of the device. So what you're saying about Scheiber's view in his connection to Adorno is fascinating. And then, but then also from the perspective of the reader panels, the BBC, um, they have, they're also being, having this sort of mingling of aesthetics and politics and whether politics has any business being in um, music and things. <laughs> We can maybe just brief, very briefly relate uh, an example of uh, politics um, arguably superseding aesthetics, which was the opera co uh, competition that was held in advance of the Festival of Britain, and where composers were, uh, uh, composers were invited to uh, submit operas anonymously and they were then judged, and the winning opera was to be performed. Now, um, the panel judged all these operas, and it turned out that the winning opera was by Bertolt Goldschmidt, who was an immigrant composer. And the Arts Council found that this was embarrassing because they didn't want an immigrant to represent Britain at the Festival of Britain. So his uh, name was struck off. So they went to the second person, and that was Karl Runkel, also an immigrant composer. Embarrassing. Let's go to number three. The third person was Alan Bush. Now, we can't have Alan Bush because he's a communist. So he's British, that's great, but he's a communist. We can't have him, you know, at the onset of the Cold War. So in the end, what they decided to do was basically they abandoned the competition and instead they commissioned Benjamin Britten uh, to write an opera, um, which, which was Billy Budd. So, I mean, there, th this is perhaps a crass answer. It's also a singular case. It is not therefore automatically representative. But I think there are so many answers to this to this question. Leah or Amanda, did you want to to contribute a comment on on this the issue between aesthetics as as politics in relation to what we've both presented? Well, there are, there are was... Sorry. Go on. Uh, I suppose I was just thinking when you were um, relating that anecdote there, Florian, that it sort of suggests the idea of an aesthetics free of politics is is completely out of reach. And and I would say that that, um, that would have been the view of many women composers simply because um, the idea that there was any sort of uh, anonymity or... Um, ability to just be one of the composers in the mix was was never was yeah was was never attainable so that so aesthetic questions were always wrapped up i think in um in a politics no matter how much a lot of women composers i mean I, i'm talking about a particular the particular era i've focused on is sort of late 19th century early 20th century but um that there were there was no matter how much one tried to distance oneself from politics, it always found, <laughs> you know, it's it sort of followed you. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, f for me, every everything is political, and I think, and I think for you know, it's partly about the position one stands in, whether whether there is such a thing as an apolitical aesthetic. Um, anyway, yeah. So maybe that's all. I, all I'll add to that. Leah, do you have anything you'd like to add to? to this, this idea? Yeah, certainly I can, I can contribute on this um, a little bit. So, you know, to build on what, what has already been said, I think. Um, and one of the sort of points that uh, makes it very clear to me how indivisible aesthetics and politics are, particularly in this period, is the reception of women's works uh, after the kind of rise of atonality and in the UK. And this once sort of atonality becomes synonymous with modernism, uh, I find it fascinating to look at the com works by composers who were still writing relatively tonal, melodic, tuneful music. And some, obviously there is some prejudice with, with the BBC, Florian, as you're saying, um, 
there's a little bit of antipathy towards uh, melodic music on some of the sort of uh, serious BBC music shows. Um, but the reception of this music, when men write melodic music, it's sort of, that's a personal choice. When women do it, it's seen as sort of revealing something essential about the nature of womanhood. And so there are these sort of comments and reviews saying, oh, you know, this concert with tonal music by woman, well, this is exactly as decorous as one always assumes a gathering of young ladies to be. And that's from the Daily Telegraph uh, in the 1960s, right? So this is not, not actually a hugely long time ago. And I think that really cements for me this relationship between aesthetics and politics and that um, the, I, the ideal of a kind of apolitical aesthetics is, is an ideal only, um, for certainly in the way that I see it. Thanks. And actually, we've ended up in, in quite a, a, a good spot as, as we near the end of this session called Women, Politics, Emigre. We, we've really, I think, explored these three very, very broad areas in quite, quite intricate ways. And, and um, in some ways, the links are obvious, but it's not until they're interrogated or set against other narratives that, that they, they come to their fore. We do have time for another question or two if if there is one or, or two lurking and and while I'm I'm going to um, allow just a few seconds for from the question I'm, I'm going to to revert to an advertisement just to remind folks that um, tonight the Smyth Quartet in E minor is going to be performed and on Wednesday night Shamus Quartet number three the Quartetto Lyrico will be um, performed on Wednesday evening. So uh, keep those two performances in mind. I'm tossing up whether I'm going to get up at four o'clock in the morning. I'm not sure. Not sure. <laughs> so well, there is time for one more question. If anyone's dying to ask a, a final question or, or a comment, please, please feel free. Um, we, we do, we do have time. But I'm not, I'm not going to linger on, on a, um, a pause to, to, um, to shame someone in asking the final question. Only that um, I think our, our, our time is up. This has been extraordinarily fascinating, incredibly intellectually stimulating and has taken, has taken our, our minds in many different, different directions. It's been a, a fabulous session. Um, please join me in thanking Leah, Amanda and Florian for the time they've put into their papers, for the care they've taken to present and, and the many questions that that they've provided us and now that Joanna is, is on the screen we can thank her in person again for for putting this terrific symposium together and uh, I wish everyone all the all the best over the next three days thank you all